Hey everyone, so here we are. We are at the end of our Bible Read Equip series. And here's the thing. As we've been doing this series, we've been kind of treating the scriptures as if we trust the scriptures, as if they are reliable, and as if they are in fact God's word. Just quickly, if you haven't seen the video in the series called What is the Bible? I will put the link in the description and in the notes. Please go watch that video. It is going to help you understand how on one hand we can say, well, when Paul said or when Luke said or when Moses said, in other words, recognizing the human elements of the scriptures. And yet at other times, us as pastors, we say things like, but this is God's word. How is the scriptures both human and divine? How do we understand these things? You will do yourself a great favor by watching that video. But that video kind of answers the question, what does the Bible say about itself? Right? But here's the thing. If you go onto TikTok or YouTube or any form of social media, or you raise conversations with people who aren't Christians, and maybe even some who are having some doubts as Christians, you are going to see a whole lot of objections, a whole lot of questions and doubts coming from people arguing that the scriptures are not reliable and there are no shortage of accusations about this. Now, here's the thing. Maybe you say that you're okay with the scriptures. You trust the scriptures. You find them reliable. You recognize them as God's word. But I can guarantee you that the people around you do not have the same kind of confidence that you have, be they family, friends, neighbors, colleagues, or simply people that you interact with daily. All right. Secondly, you also may come across a time when one of these arguments just gets under your skin a little bit and maybe starts to seem a little bit persuasive and sows a seed of doubt in you. And yet here we are, the scriptures that we do trust say that we need to be prepared to give a good answer for the faith that we have, which includes we need to have good answers concerning these scriptures that are so central for us as believers. So do we have anything to say? When people come to us with questions and doubts, or when we maybe start having our own questions and doubts, how are we going to respond? Do we have any evidence that we can point to concerning the reliability of the scriptures. Now, I cover this in a lot more detail in my book, and there are other great resources that cover this in way more detail. Having said that, I want to show you some of the evidence that we do have that can really become a baseline for your understanding with regards to your defense of the scriptures as a reliable historical document. Now, the first line of evidence that we're going to look at is what is known as bibliographical evidence. All right. You see, when historians are looking at ancient documents, whether it be the New Testament or whether it be other non-biblical ancient documents, they have a set of criteria that are going to help them evaluate the reliability of these documents. You see, the cynic and the skeptic, they're going to come to us and they're going to say things like this. Listen, have you ever played the broken telephone game? You know, a bunch of kids sit around in a circle. You whisper one sentence into one kid's ears. They go around the circle. And by the time it comes back, that sentence is completely confused, right? And they say, listen, we can't even preserve this in five minutes. How are we going to preserve the reliability of the scriptures over hundreds of years. So how do historians look at the historical reliability of ancient documents? Well, there are two main criteria that they look at. And the first one is how many ancient copies do we have of the original? Think about it. If you find an ancient document and you only have one of them, all right, how are you going to know what is an original copy of the original writing or what was a mistake? You've got no way. However, if you have two copies, you're going to start to see discrepancies, possibly, 
But which is the correct version and which is the incorrect version? The more copies you have, the more you are able to sort that stuff out. So number of copies is very important here. The other one is when it comes to all of these ancient documents, we do not have the originals of any of these documents. However, we are going to be looking at the time gap between the original time of writing of the documents and the oldest manuscript that we have. So the general idea is if we have a shorter gap there, Plus, if we have multiple ancient copies of these documents, we can build up a high level of confidence with regards to the bibliographical evidence of these ancient documents. So let's look at how some of these other ancient documents fare. So other than the Bible, the most reliable ancient document that we have is Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad was written in about 800 BC and the earliest copy that we have is from 400 BC. So we have a time gap of 400 years. All right. Then to date, we have about 1,500 ancient copies of Homer's Iliad. Let's look at a couple of other ancient documents. We've got Herodotus. Uh, he's often called the father of history and he wrote down histories that were around 450 BC. But the earliest copies we have of his writings are 10th century AD. Do the maths. We have a gap of about 1,450 years. That is not insignificant at all. And then on top of that, we have about 49 papyrus fragments of Herodotus's histories. Then let's talk about one more. We've got Plato, who's kind of the foundational person when it comes to Western philosophy. He wrote his seven tetralogies around 400 BC. We have about 210 of his ancient manuscripts with the oldest that we have being 895 AD. So once again, we're looking at a gap of about 1,500 years. Now, in terms of raising these documents, I'm not looking for the kind of the most obscure documents to try and make the Bible look so much more awesome than these other ancient documents. I'm looking at mainline documents that are historically reliable. When your philosophy lecturer talks about Plato, no one sticks up their hands saying, but we've got this gap of 1,500 years. We cannot trust these documents. No one is querying these things. So when we compare the New Testament to these documents, what do we find? Well, the earliest papyrus that we have, admittedly, it's a fragment. It's not the whole of the Gospel of John because it is from the Gospel of John. It's not the whole New Testament. But the earliest fragment that we have compared to the time of writing is not a gap of 1,500 years, not even a gap of 400 years, but a gap of 40 years. And then when we look at the number of ancient copies that we've got, if we look at the number of ancient Greek copies that we've got, because the New Testament was written in common Greek, we have over 5,000 copies. Very quickly, the New Testament was translated into other ancient languages. And if we add those copies in, we have over 21,000 copies of the New Testament. All right. Then when we look at complete copies of entire New Testament books, we're looking at about 200 AD, which depending on the book puts us at about 120 to 160 years after the time of writing. And then when we look at the entire New Testament, we're looking at fourth century. All right. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing that whether we're looking at our earliest copy, and we treat the New Testament exactly the same way we treat other ancient documents or whether we're looking at the number of copies. Not only is the New Testament just on par with some of these documents or slightly more reliable than these documents, we can very confidently say that the New Testament is the most reliable ancient document that we have which can give us great confidence when it comes to our faith, right? All right, so that is the bibliographical line of evidence. Let's look at a second line of evidence, which is archaeological evidence. 
Once again, you go into Reddit, YouTube, TikTok, and you're gonna see many cynics and skeptics and atheists claiming that, listen, your scriptures talk about such and such a person, such and such a king, such and such a town. We have been looking through these archeological digs and we find no evidence of these people and these places. Therefore, your Bible is full of nonsense. Close it, let's be done with it. Now listen, we are claiming that not only do the scriptures have divine wisdom for us, we don't just have philosophical ideas, we are claiming that our Bible and that the historical basis of our scriptures are actually rooted in history. That there were actual events happening around the time of scriptures. That if you were there, you would have been witness to real history. God working in real history. And so historical rootedness is very important for us as Christians. So let me give you two examples where people have claimed that this line of evidence is missing and then all of a sudden it shows up in our archaeological findings. And the first one concerns Pontius Pilate. All right, so for almost 2,000 years, cynics were saying that we can't find any evidence that Pontius Pilate even existed. So we don't know if we can trust your New Testament. Until 1961, when people were digging in Caesarea, what they discovered was a stone known as the Pilate Stone, and on it it said this, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea which is incredible, right? Because people for almost 2000 years had been denying that this was there. Then more recently, and I don't actually cite this example in my book, but people were saying similar things about the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Old Testament story where there was this incredible corruption that God came and destroyed these cities in his judgment righteously. And because they're saying we can't find these towns, we don't know if we can trust your scriptures. So more recently, some evidence has come out where people were digging in an area where the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah roughly would have been. And by the way, these archaeologists weren't Christians who are looking for ways to prove the Bible. These were just secular archaeologists trying to do what they do. And they came across this very interesting layer, which was about five foot deep. And they saw very quickly that this layer was telling the story of an incredible moment of destruction that had happened in the city's history. But they didn't know what it was all about. One of the more interesting things about this layer of destruction is they found these tiny little diamondoids, each diamondoid being roughly the size of a flu virus, so really, really small. But here's the thing, if you know anything about diamonds, you know that they are formed under extreme pressure and temperature conditions. So this told them that whatever this destruction was, was under extreme pressure and temperature conditions. The kind of pressure and temperature that would literally melt a car in minutes. So as they were trying to piece this together, they couldn't imagine what kind of event would have formed these kinds of things. But the closest natural explanation that they could come up with was concerning an event that happened in Russia in 1908, where tens of millions of trees were flattened in an instant. What happened there was that an asteroid had entered the atmosphere and a few kilometers above the ground had exploded. And they started seeing similarities between that event and the events around this archeological dig. Now, whether God used this event or not, once again, we are seeing that the archeological evidence always seems to confirm what the scriptures are saying. As the evidence piles up, we see greater and greater evidence as opposed to fewer and fewer lines of evidence confirming the scriptures. Now, the third line of evidence I want to speak about concerns the prophetic reliability of the scriptures. So what's that all about? I want you to imagine that for argument's sake, um, you're going through an old city and you find an old safe and so you open the safe and it can be proven that the safe has been locked for 200 years. You open the safe, in the safe is an envelope, you pull out the envelope and the envelope is a letter with a whole lot of facts kind of describing what life will be like for us now 
200 years later. Now imagine reading these facts and in these facts you have some very pointed details. For example, the name of the presidents, the name of his wife, the name of the town that he's from. Now if you know anything about South Africa, many of our towns are younger than 200 years. In other words, they would have had this insight concerning the future and there would have been no way of knowing what these details would have been. And now imagine all of that lines up, right? How would you explain that? Well, that is exactly what we have concerning the scriptures. We have prophecies in the Old Testament, some of which are fulfilled later in the Old Testament. We have prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled, for example, by Christ and in the age of the church. And this, of course, gives us great confidence concerning some of the prophecies that are still yet to be fulfilled. For example, the fact that Jesus will return and he will make all things new. Now, the Old Testament was completed 400 years before Jesus. And in the time of the Old Testament, the prophets, according to God's Spirit, were looking forward and they foresaw the coming of this King, this Messiah fulfilled later by Jesus. So if we only focus on those, we see over 300 references concerning the coming Messiah fulfilled by Jesus, including his virgin birth, his tribe, his dad's name, the lineage of King David, his birthplace, the way that he would be killed, by the way, crucifixion wasn't even invented by the time this was written down. So here's what some people have said. Some people have said, well, Jesus was simply coming along and he was going to self-fulfill these prophecies. After all, here they are in the Old Testament. So it says the king is going to come into Jerusalem on a donkey. All right, somebody get me my donkey. Now, maybe that could be true for some of these prophecies. However, the large majority of these prophecies, Jesus would have had no control over. For example, how do you control where you're born? How do you control that Jesus' family took him from his birthplace into Egypt so he could fill those prophecies? And so on and so forth. What uh, mathematicians have done is they took only eight prophecies concerning Jesus and they worked out the stats. What if Jesus just accidentally fulfilled these prophecies without being who he truly was and therefore guided ultimately by God? What are the statistical chances of fulfilling only eight of these prophecies? And in an attempt to kind of put these stats into a visual form, they said, imagine taking the state of Texas, which for you and I, we live in South Africa, roughly the same size. Imagine taking South Africa and filling the whole country until it was two feet deep in five rand coins. Now imagine taking one of those five rand coins, drawing an X on it, and then turning these coins over and over, and then taking someone, blindfolding them, and letting them walk around until they stop and pick up a coin. The chances of that person picking up the coin with the X on it are the statistical chances of Jesus just by chance fulfilling these prophecies. In other words, mathematically, there is no chance that Jesus just accidentally fulfilled these prophecies. So even for those who don't trust the scriptures, we believe that the prophetic reliability of the scriptures can grow our confidence in the scriptures that we do have. Now, if you've ever had a conversation with someone who has any doubt concerning the scriptures, one of the common things that they raise are the so-called contradictions or what we would call the apparent contradictions in scripture. Once again, the, the internet is full of this kind of stuff. They take this verse and they say, well, this seems to contradict this verse and therefore I don't know if I can trust the scriptures. And at first that may shake you and that may seem very compelling. Now, the way many of these so-called contradictions are resolved is understanding the difference between a contradictory idea and a complementary idea. A contradictory and a complementary idea. For example, imagine I went shopping later and someone came to you and said, hey, I saw Steve at the shops and someone said he was wearing a checkered shirt, like this one, and someone else said, no, he was wearing a blue shirt. Now imagine your response was, well, one of you is lying. 
However, if we see these two ideas not as contradictory, but complementary, you get the shirt that I'm wearing today, right? And so many of these are resolved in this way. Let me give you two examples. Matthew 27 verses 5 says that Judas hung himself. Acts 1 verses 18 says that he bought a field and he fell headlong into it and his guts burst open. Sorry for the dramatic imagery here. And so people have said, here we've got a contradiction. However, what if we have complementary ideas? I think it doesn't take too much thinking to realize that what more than likely happened was that Judas went and bought the field, but then in his guilt, he hung himself on this branch until the time came that after a few days, right after having, sorry, rotten a little bit, maybe the wind blew and the rope broke and then he fell headlong down into his field and his guts came out. I think that is very plausible. If one of the verses said that he was stabbed to death or a wild animal ate him, then we would be unable to make these complementary ideas. However, Seeing these two verses in a complementary way makes a whole lot of sense. Here's another example. People point out that in Matthew 28 verses 5, that there is only one angel, whereas in John 20 verses 12, there are two angels. Once again, a contradiction. However, I do believe that this is easily resolved. What if Matthew is simply referring to the angel doing the speaking, whereas John is adding the additional detail of how many angels there are. If anything, and you may have seen this in shows like Law & Order, when lawyers get witnesses together and start to interrogate them, when their stories are too aligned, then they start getting nervous that these witnesses have gotten together and they're actually trying to slip one past you. When these witnesses have different perspectives, true perspectives, but different perspectives, telling the story truthfully in different ways, remembering different details, that actually adds truthfulness to the evaluation rather than throwing greater doubt. Finally, a very common objection to the Bible is that the Bible is just a myth. In other words, maybe there was this great teacher, this great prophet known as Jesus of Nazareth, but uh, his followers kind of embellished the details a little bit and then their followers embellished the details even more until eventually the stories that people were telling about Jesus are no longer anything about the actual truth. Now the biggest problem when it comes to this claim is that there are simply not enough years that would have passed between the time of these events and the time that the New Testament was written down. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is writing about the resurrection, which by the way was a very public event. This is not this little thing that happened in a cave, like for example Mormonism or Islam, where no one can verify these things. These were very public events, and when Paul is writing 1 Corinthians 15, he is referring to a number of eyewitnesses. He does say that yes, some of them have passed away, but the point is many of them are still alive, including a large group where Paul refers to about 500 people witnessing the resurrected Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, listen, if you doubt me, go and ask so-and-so, go and ask so-and-so eyewitnesses to the event. Let me give you a bit of an updated example of that. If someone had to say that the Holocaust didn't happen, either they would need to be in another part of space and time where no one can actually go and verify these things, or they'd have to come and try and say these things hundreds of years later, which by the way is exactly what Islam is. Islam comes along six, seven hundred years after the events of Christ and is coming with a revisionist version of history. So back to the Holocaust idea. We still have eyewitnesses who are currently alive. Not only do we have living eyewitnesses, we have dozens if not 
hundreds of well-documented books and records concerning the Holocaust. And therefore, nobody can claim, although I know that some do try and claim, nobody can claim with any success that the Holocaust didn't exist. That is exactly what is happening in 1 Corinthians 15 and elsewhere in the New Testament. So as I wrap up, in 1974, Time magazine, once again, not a Christian publication, they ran this cover story, all right, just asking these kinds of questions. Can we trust the New Testament? Now, I know here we are in 2022, many years after 1974, but I think it is very profound what they discovered. This is what they said. After more than two centuries of facing the heaviest guns that could be brought to bear, the Bible has survived and is perhaps better for the siege. Even on the critics' own terms, historical facts, which is what we've been looking at today, the scriptures seem more acceptable now than they did when the rationalists began the attack. I'm hoping you're seeing that while some people believe they have reason to doubt the historical reliability of the Bible, that when we put all of this evidence together, we have the scriptures as we have them, God's word, a reliable witness to the events that they point to. We can confidently trust our Bible. Once again, maybe some of you are saying, Stephen, you're preaching to the choir. I am already convinced. I want to encourage all of you to take a few of these events and in at some level, make it your mission to learn and memorize these facts. You never know when you will need to talk about this, either to your kids, to your family, preaching it to yourself. If your own doubt starts to cause you to waver a little bit, you never know when you will need these in conversation. Once again, the scriptures say that we should be equipped to answer these questions that come our way. I really hope and pray that your confidence in the scriptures has grown, that you feel like you have more conversation points with some of those who maybe have some doubts, but that for every single one of us, our conviction and our confidence is growing and that our knowledge, therefore, of Christ is growing even more. God bless you in this.